Returning from my regular retreat to the rainforests of South America, Dr. Bruce stews for you a potpourri of talks and discussions from this past summer's Burning Man Festival. 2013 was a truly lucky year with warm nights on the Black Rock Playa, the northern Nevada desert upon which Burning Man is situated. This year I presented raps at four camps riding around between venues on my black and silver cruiser bike. The talks were woven together into one integrated story, or at least I hoped it came out that way for those who caught all four. The first talk held at Shift Camp, titled Tractor Beaming Through Outer and Inner Space, was recorded, but due to intense wind noise and musically potent art cars roaming the nearby esplanade, I considered it to be a total loss and gave it a toss. I promised to make it up to you some other time, and I'll do this talk again in another venue. The next talk, held in a soaring, multi-hued fabric structure at Sacred Spaces Village, was much cleaner. Although you will hear the occasional gust and gusto of adjacent yoga and dance performance groups this village is known for. The next two talks, Reimagining the World, held at Fractal Planet and hosted by Andrew Jones and Andrew O'Keefe, and The Return of Mitochondrial Eve, held at our home base at Palenque Norte, Camp Soft Landing, will be coming to you soon on the Levity Zone. Last is a spirited conversation with author and visionary Jonathan Zapp, which I hope makes its way to you also. So, I hope that this series fills in the detail that I spun together at Symbiosis, presented in the previous podcast, number 18. At the end of that talk, someone asked me, Is this the return of the eschaton? Eschatons, thanks Terence McKenna, are fun future histories of the end of time that will probably never happen. They seem to keep people getting up in the morning or keep them up at night, but I think that they need to be studiously avoided for now, 2020 notwithstanding. As Terence's brother has said, they're all just stories. So, dear listeners, please understand... These are all just stories, but our culture may need some new stories if they can help guide lives for the better and make sense of our place in the universe. So on to today's romp through 90 million years of history, the history of us primate monkeys. About a dozen minutes into this talk, a piece of pure playa magic happened in the form of a beautiful blue live dragonfly who soared into the pavilion and flew over our collective heads three times. And this just after I had told the tale of how our proto-primate ancestors hunted dragonflies out on the limbs of rainforest giants. Everything and everyone stopped as we gasped and gazed in amazement. The storytelling then went on to a new conclusion, that we monkeys must grasp and clasp our sacred power, that which comes from group closeness, eye contact, and sharing. For this is the only way we will push back against the onslaught of our own making, the tightening serpent's coil of technology, and the thrall of some of our monkey masters. Thanks to futurist David Houle for setting up and hosting this session. There was a great man named Buckminster Fuller who a few decades ago said that humanity is approaching a fork in the road. Either take the path to utopia or the path to oblivion. And what I try to do in my life, and I know Bruce, who has become a very good friend, does in his, is to help 
better prepare for the wonderful present, the magnificent future that can be for all of us. So I'm basically here to introduce Dr. Light to give you the story, a 90 million year story of how we got here. And then we will talk and we will open it up to questions for Bruce. And we intend to be here uh, until five. So may I introduce my good friend, Dr. Bruce Damer, Dr. Light. Can you hear me? I think I can. You can hear me because I can hear me. I can hear myself through this thing. Uh, how many of you have an interest in sort of paleobiology, like origins of how we got here, origin of life, and stuff like that? How many of you are interested in dinosaurs? <laughs> how many are interested in monkeys? How about monkeys that riding on the backs of dinosaurs? <laughs> in, in the tradition of all good Hollywood thrillers, our story is one just like it. And I've been doing for 20, 25 years work in science and in origins of life and in space. Uh, 10 years of work for NASA doing mission designs. Uh, if, if some of you were at the talk yesterday, I talked about a mission that I've designed for NASA to figure out if living organisms from the Earth can live on asteroid material. And that's now gone to headquarters and they may fly it. And I said, carve my name on it so I get some credit this time. <laughs> So I, I'm interested in asteroids and, of course, as a young kid, you know, dinosaurs and what those two come together, magic happens. Asteroids, dinosaurs, right? We're here because of that combination. But let me take you back, really far back. Uh, so the Earth is formed, it's a molten ball, it's, it's the Hadean period. They call it the Hadean period because it's like hell. If you could run a cruise ship line in this period, you could have this cruise ship that would be pushing through molten lava and everybody be under a dome. And you could throw all your bilge and your cigarettes and your old hamburgers overboard. Because why? Because the moon wasn't there yet. The moon was formed by a massive collision of a, of a planet the size of Mars coming into the Earth and spraying the whole system out, just like a great big destroyed watermelon. And then all of that came back into an accretion disk, and then the moon formed in about 30 days. Can you believe that? 30 days. And so your Hadean cruise ship members would be watching the planetesimal come in, and it'd be like the big part of the show, and just before they're all wiped out, they get beamed away, but, and all the, the ship is gone and everything. It was, a, it was a bad hair day on the Earth. But the, the interesting thing is, we have a freakishly large moon, and in, when it was formed, it, it took a fifth of the sky. It was close in. Fifth of the sky. Can you imagine being on the playa with the moon that was one fifth the sky? And of course, it's glowing orange because it's still uh, molten. It would be interesting you know, to have a Burning Man in that environment. But um, so what happens after that? So then there's this moon system, and the moon goes further and further and further out until it lo tidally locks. And now it's a nice, soft, white. It's all cooled down. And then all this crap comes in. It's called the late heavy bombardment. All this crap that made the Hudson Bay, for example. This was not a good hair day either. Maybe a few Buffon hairstyles made it through that one. But along with it came in comets. Comets slammed into the earth and gave us our oceans. You are made of comet stuff. You know, every bottle of water here on the playa, you're spraying and spritzing yourself with bits of comet from the old solar system. A cool thought, huh? So then roll the clock, we went through the slime phase. You know, when you see like mold on your bread, well mold is a high tech thing, but when you see slime in the pond or water and it's bubbly and it's all gross, well that was about two year, two billion years of the earth was the gross, bubbling, stinky, 
sulfurous slime period, and that those guys scrubbed our atmosphere and produced breathable air for us. So thank them every time you see them. I always do. You know. And uh, then somehow wiggling things and large things and fishes happened. And then one day the slime was on the shoreline and said, oh my god, we've been at this shoreline for two billion years and no one ever noticed that there's a there's something called land up there. So the slime started to move onto the land and became a hyper sea. It dragged the ocean up onto the land. And the plants are like channels of ocean water that cover the continents. But Earth is a fairly drab place. I mean, you go back there and, you know, you've got fishes in the sea and everything. It's a fairly mellow place. You don't have you know, it's not very colorful, not like this group here. So but where did the color come in? Well, the color came in in a strange way. The color came in when the plants, having established themselves firmly on the land, you know, hundred foot tall fern trees that, that come out, uh, weird looking plants that, that we have around still, but there are not that many of them. They looked around and they said, the 100-foot fern tree said, I'm really totally obsessed with that fern tree over there. I'd love to have sex with him slash her. But we're plants. I can't even get, get over there. So this whole planet was like incredibly horny, but with nothing to do, nothing to make, make it happen. So a plant one day said, I've got the ticket. We're going to seduce, the only thing that's moving are these things called arthropods, the insects, and there's even flying dragonflies. There was a dragonfly that had a wingspan like this. Can you imagine that? Because there were no birds or big things, so the insects filled all the niches. So there was nothing else. So dragonflies, and they're trucking around, and they're eating plants and everything. The plant says, we've got it. If we can seduce them, we can have sex. So a plant sort of, you know, the Madre spoke to this plant and said, well, get a fashion sense. And so this plant, instead of just having a good old green chlor chlorophyll leaf, it had a pink leaf. So this pink leaf attracted the attention of the insect. So maybe it was a dragonfly, maybe it was a kind of a proto-bee-like thing. And it, it's like pink. There was no pink before. <laughs> You know, we didn't have Tutu Tuesday. <laughs> it was just a Tutu Tuesday came to the biosphere. So the insect landed on that pink leaf. And the plant's like, cool, but uh, what do we do now? And it turns out the stamen was next. And the stamen was like the sex organ and, the, you know, the little sugar on it and et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, you know, they get, you know, when you make love, I mean, there's lots of crap all around, so the insects are carrying all this stuff to their next little orgy on the next pink leaf over on that tree fern, and bingo, you've got sexual reproduction. When this happened, this was such an advantage for these plants to finally mix it up, mix their genes up, that within a couple of million years, the flowering plants came and the entire planet bloomed. The planet went from, you know, bland greens and browns and grays to just psychedelic. The whole planet went bam, psychedelic. All colors, all shapes, you know, everything. Incredible creativity. There were no animals around. That was the peak of the trip of the plants. That was in the Devonian. You had plants from pole to pole. They were just so vibrant. You know, you had a richer atmosphere than that. You have a, you know, a beautiful flowering plant, and then you have fruit that comes. And the fruit was the sex that attracted the animals. Our four-legged four tetrapod lizard-like things are going around, oh, this, this smells good, and it's a piece of rotting fruit, and eats that, and seeds go into its stomach, and it carries it, the, the plant somewhere else. So sex with animals. Plants had sex with animals then. You see where I'm going with this. <laughs> Um, so roll the clock forward and now you have this interesting situation where you have lots of animals. The dinosaurs. You have lizards, you have fishes, etc. Et and you have the beginnings of mammals. These furry little, basically, dumpster divers. We were nature's dumpster divers. And it, and it turns out that dumpster diving animals are the ones that inherit the earth. So, 
all of you out there, and I know who you are, <laughs> you can survive, you can thrive in the world of the dumpster. So here's how it works. You have us little furry creatures, warm-blooded, running around. Some of our forebears were on the ground in tunnels and things like that. But we, at 90 million years BC, were in the tree canopy of the rainforest. And they know this because they found a femur bone 55 million years old. Roll the clock back. Genetically, the proto-monkey, proto-ape, proto-human lived in the forest canopy was an insectivore. We, we ate insects, we hunted those dragonflies. To get a dragonfly was a major kill. It was like bagging a steer or something. In, in the colonies of these tiny, tiny animals, uh, they would munch down leaves, and early in the morning, they would go out and find dew and tree sap balls and suck them down, and that was the, the sugar that they ate. Because that's how insectivores live now. And so we had a burger, fries, and a shake diet from day one. Don't feel guilty. That was our diet. So how did we live? We lived in an environment where all those colorful flowers, all those trees, all those flowers were suffused our environment. Kind of like your, what you're wearing there, you know. We were turned on by color because we were surrounded by it. So we were one of, I believe, the first animal that could see in color in 3D. Think about that for a second. The dinosaurs, we're not quite sure, but we're thinking they're sort of black and white, you know. They probably had infrared vision, God knows. I mean, these were mis killing machines. And a lot of the dinosaurs had the eyes on the side. Lizards have eyes on the top. We had eyes looking forward. We could see in 3D. We had depth perception. Can you imagine depth perception? Speaking of a dragon. Oh my goodness. It's Okay. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Thank you. It's going for that ice cream cone. <laughs> wow. That's uh, that's Playa matching right there. There he is, or she is there. Oh, she's not going to survive long out here. She's blue. Look at that. Oh my goodness. Trying to land her here. You know? <laughs> I'm floored. I'll just take a pause here for a second. So, uh, hmm. where was I? <laughs> okay. So, consider that the largest biota, the largest living thing on the planet, is the forest. It's interconnected, it covers the continents, it reaches into the sea. It's massive. Mycelial layer, we've heard about the mycelium. It's a massive, massive thing. If there's any intelligence or any consciousness in Gaia, it has to be in the planetary plant body. It has to be. It's not going to be in a tomato plant or an individual goldfish. It's in the big thing. So it's something we can talk to, I believe, and it's something that can talk to us. And many of you in this, how many have talked to the planetary plant body? How many have been talked to by the planetary plant body? So here's how it goes. The dinosaurs are rolling along, but they're not evolving. They fill all the niches pretty fast, but they're pretty self-centered. They don't look at the stars. They just eat all day. They're kind of dull. So if the madre, or the mother, is the planetary plant body, one day she just is fed up. She's fed up, there's limited time where the Earth can support her, her presence. Because the Earth only has about a billion and a half year run for plants to be on land. It's a short term deal. Plants on land is a complete luxury because the sun is gradually getting warmer and warmer. And we're not talking global warming, we're talking over about a five billion year period. And the land can only support these vibrant forests for so long. 
you know, come back in 500 million years, you won't see forests. You'll see them at the edges and the margins, but it'll be all desert. That's where we're headed. So this is back 65 million years ago when the forests are still peaking. So she says to herself, I gotta do something. This is going nowhere. And bingo, one day, her presence is locked into one of these little magic monkeys, one of our proto-ancestors. And she can see through the eyes of that little character, that little creature. She can see herself for the first time. So evolution, her great partner, made binocular color vision, but she never got around to checking out all the products of evolution. It's kind of a big, big field. And one day she snaps too, and she sees herself for the first time. The monkey's going out on its little limb, and it looks down into the forest, and there's a dawn, and there's a mist, and then she gets a global download. That's how I am. That's the reality of who I am. I'm a rainforest. I have vines that hang down 200 feet tall. And then she realizes I'm magnificent. What am I dealing with these, these schlep dinosaurs for? You know, these dinosaurs are not worthy of this creation. And she talks to her friends, the microbial asteroid steerers in the solar system. She says, I need a big one, maybe bigger than last time. She ordered the extinction of the trilobites 200 million years ago with an impact. I'm done with them. And the trilobites were off. 95% of life was destroyed in that impact. So she orders the second hit. And she gets a little nervous. So she's getting in her lawn chair in the Yucatan. The asteroid's been steered by all the bacteria that do all the work in the galaxy to do this sort of stuff. And it's coming in. And she orders a bigger one. She says, I'm nervous that this won't work. I want a bigger hit. You know how sometimes, how many people have done that? <laughs> so, not an honest crowd. Not an honest crowd. Was, so, here we are, and she's decided the Yucatan, right on the equator, right there on that distance, we're going to make this count. It's going to be just this is my day. So, here comes the bow line. A friend of mine modeled this on 1,500 computers, and you can see it at the American Museum of Natural History in New York, in the Hayden Planetarium. You can see this impact. It's so damned impressive. Oh my gosh. It comes in, slams into the Yucatan. We know because we found the crater at Chichla. It's hundreds of miles across. It goes into the Earth's crust. Mama is sitting in her lawn chair, like, whoa, what a show. And then she sees the sheet wall of lava rise. The sheet wall, two miles high of molten lava. It's like, whoa, what a feeling that is, right? So, but then she sees the horror. It's too big. There's too much energy because as the sheet wall of lava falls, rises the globule. It's too big of an impact, so the droplet has been created. The droplet is miles across, and it is rising to orbit. And she says, I'm fucked, or I fucked myself, <laughs> which she did. So it rises to orbit, and you can see this in this planetarium show. It splits up into a spray of molten globules. I like to think of them as hot sperm because they're crashing down upon the Earth through the atmosphere all over the planet. They burn the atmosphere on the way in. They slam in, everything burns, the forest burn. 30 feet of ocean boil off in, within 24 hours. It's 500 degrees at the surface of the planet, like the, the heat of an oven, you know, put a turkey in there. And as she's going dark, as the forests are burning, she's like, what have I done? The things that I have chosen live in the, on tree limbs, and they're little delicate things, and they're watching mountain-sized molten lava balls coming down on them. They're never going to make it. I'm done for. And she goes dark. Well, the dinosaurs didn't make it. We know that. Maybe as birds, the only thing that came through. We did. How in the heck did we get through that?
how did we do that? Maybe what we did is one of the great miracles. This is why we don't need extraterrestrials and all this other stuff to explain. We are a miracle on Earth, uh, a bipedal miracle. We are an incredible miracle machine that we made it even through that, let alone everything else. So perhaps a whole colony fell to the ground and scurried into a very large log. But then what do you do after that when all the forests have burned, the atmosphere is full of smoke, there's no sunlight again, what do you eat? Bingo, we can eat trash. This is why we made it through. We were dumpster divers. So we would actually go down after the dinosaurs had killed some poor innocent thing, we would sneak down and grab bits of it and go back up, steal steaks off the griddle. And so we were good at eating trash, that's how we made it through. Dumpster divers are the survivors. So picture the scene, the forests roar back, pole to pole. Amazingly enough, she comes to consciousness again, the Madre comes to consciousness. It's like. I'm back, how could I possibly have made it? The forests are even more vibrant. You know, all that ash and all that stuff, it's a second chance from this, this disaster. And in the treetops, she finds us a little bit more evolved. We're now three inches long. Our eyes are a little bit bigger. And we have something else in our sights that she didn't expect, but is very interesting. We have become totally obsessed by color. Why? Because there's a thing, our biggest enemy in the trees is the tree snake. The flying dinosaurs are gone, the birds are just barely birding, so there's no other danger to our ancestors but snakes. Of course, snakes are going to live through anything, right? So they're, they're in the tree limbs, and we're like popcorn, we're like, we're like goobers for them. So here you are, here's Little Overdrive, the three inch long teenage protoprimate in the comfort ball, because we slept just like everybody is here, in a little comfort ball, that was our natural mode. And she breaks herself free from the ball and goes out at, the, at dawn and sneaks along the limb because she sees this globule of sugar, the globule of tree sap. And she's down on her little haunches, and she's sucking it down. One eye is looking back at the ball of the colony, thinking, if they see me, I'm busted. Sound familiar? <laughs> One eye is looking forward as she sucks in this tree sap. She's looking forward, and she sees about a foot away this color pattern. Part of it is because she's getting a little high on the sugar. She's got to get that sugar in her. Not get busted, but she's looking at this color pattern. What is that color pattern? It's snake scales. It's snake scales. And those snakes have it co-evolved for millions of years with those little protoprimates. So those snake scales are changing constantly. They're getting more and more complicated, more and more mesmerizing, more and more alluring than they were before. Snake scales. And so she's like, cool color pattern, and I don't know what that means, but cool, cool, cool. And in the meantime, the head of the snake is moving under the branch, and it's going to come up and snap her down. So she has to be able to break that and realize it's a snake. If you're walking along, and you see a snake on the ground, what happens to you? You just jump. You don't even think about it. You see it, and you jump back, because it's hardwired into us. The snake scale pattern is hardwired. So, she has to be able to recognize the danger, but she's so entranced by this color pattern. And we're still entranced by color. Look around here. So that's the dynamic. That's where we came from. For us, for our ancestor, our common ancestor, that was most of their world. We're like a little pencil shaving on the end of that. But for the most of our evolution, that was our reality. But that's the origin of vision. That's the origin of the visionary experience of color, binocular vision, going back to sex with plants and sex with animals. It's that source. And then the stimulated brain started then. We're talking you know, 90, 80, 70, 60 million years ago. This is old stuff. It's old programming. And so everything that you're doing here at Burning Man, when you go out on the fly at night, it's the snake. It's the allure of the snake, you know, 
Burning Man has consumed you for a week. It's chewing you up. And hopefully it's spinning you out in better shape. Everything here, this entire thing is all, what is it? It's, it's snake scales. We're mesmerized by snake scales. What is the newest mesmer that has come into our lives? Screens. First was books, illustrated books, printed books, television screens, computer screens, CRTs, most of you don't remember what those are, but uh, flat panel monitors, and now, you know, mobile phones, cell phones, glass, Google Glass. That is the coming to us of the most powerful rendition of the snake has appeared on our branch. And, you know, we are sucking down that sugar on a daily basis, it's called Starbucks, or Coke, or whatever. And we are glued into that snake pattern. And what is happening? The technology is eating our ass. It's eating our prana, and why is there so much yoga in the world? There was a yoga session here just before we started. Because people are losing contact with their bodies. All that as the snake is eating our ass, you know, sucking us down. So this is all going on. And the manic monkey that we are, there was a break. Somehow in the manic monkey phase, we ended up having a split between male and female. And that's my talk for Friday. It's called the mitochondrial Eve, our common mother. So come 3 o'clock Friday at 9.15 and B and you'll hear about her. That's an important part of the story, but I can't fit it into to this wrap today. But consider what is going on now. The madre, or the mother of the planetary plant body, she's trucking along these manic monkeys. Look at all those color patterns. They've really gotten with the fluorescence thing. And they're getting the technology thing. And I asked her, do you mind that we're cutting you down, that we're cutting the trunks of the great rainforest giants, and that we're slash and burn forests, and that we desertify the Levant, is now all desert? And her answer was, no, go for it, as long as you provide me a way to find a new home. So I said, well, what do you mean? She said, this planet, it's a womb, but it's a tomb and there's a limited time. Remember we talked about that plants couldn't be on land for more than another three to 400, 500 million years. She feels her oats have been sown and that she's getting old in the bone. So it's a conundrum. So I asked her, well, couldn't you do it all over? Couldn't you order another strike and you could pick arthropods and pick, pick the spider or the cockroach? Pick the cockroach for the next, for the next try. She said, it's too late. See, they're hopelessly badly designed anyway because of the exoskeleton. They're you know, even worse than you guys. They just eat everything. So we're her shot. We're her only shot. And she said, take all the palladium. Take all the petroleum. Cut all the force, but give me a way out. Give me a vine to climb. Allow me to go and see. I need to see outside the planet. I need to see across the limb of the planet, across the atmosphere, to see where the next home may be. I said, I can take you there now. Because for 10 years, in my manic monkey brain, I modeled the solar system for NASA. I designed mission. We did maybe 25 projects. And the latest mission was how to grow stuff on asteroids. So I said, Mama, I'll show you that the monkey has done it. So we went first into the solar system in a, in a visual sense, and we landed on the moon. We landed near Apollo 15's base. And she said, this soil is too dry. I can never take hold in this place. I said, let's keep on going. So we went to Mars, and we landed next to the decommissioned rover of the two that went there 10 years ago. And I took the belly pan off the bottom. The Madre put her hand on the belly pan. And I asked her, what do you feel? And she said, I feel life. I said, yeah, these are clean room bacteria that have survived the journey. NASA tries to fumigate and otherwise dry out and otherwise remove them. They can't. They can never get life out of the system. So she feels there's a biofilm in here. It's vibrant. It's got a little bit of metabolism, a little bit of moisture, but it's, it's in there for the long haul. It'll be there in a million years. As long as that 
case stays closed and the radiation can't get in. So I said to her, life is already here. The manic monkey has placed life here. There is hope. There is definitely hope. On my next journey to talk to the Madre, though, I have a message. And this is where the conversation goes more two-way. Because you can't assume anything, even when talking to planetary plant bodies. You just can't assume that they know how to do email and, you know, that they can interpret language. Terence McKenna talked about the language of the elf universe, you know, the trickster language and the codes and trying to read those glyphs. I mean, you, you just can't assume that it's like a plain English and be in your culture. So when I go back to her, it's come to me that I have to let her know that her best laid plans may not bear fruit unless intervention is forthcoming because of one thing, the rise of the snake. I don't think she understands tech. She's not a nerd, for God's sakes, or for madre or mother's sakes or goddess sakes. She's not a nerd. She's an incredible chemical architect. It's all chemistry. It's not symbol. It's not electrical. There's a little bit of electrical tech in plants, but not much. So this is the language you're speaking. The language of metals, the language of silicon, the language of beach sand. You know, this is what the manic monkey, what we built our ladders from, our ladders to consciousness. But it's not her tech. So perhaps all of us collectively, when we're in contact with that madre, give her a little bit of wisdom about what's going on with us. She needs an education. And the biggest news that's going on with us is what we're doing today, where we're here as human beings, sweaty, hugging, eye contact. I made an eye contact with a New Yorker the other day. He was here on the playa. And I, weird! <laughs> totally weird. Like, you're a New Yorker and you're making an eye contact and you're not crazy, you're not about to mug me and, you know, like, there's, there's, this is a huge power here, you know? So the thing that's going on is eye contact is disappearing. Why, why do we have so much eye contact here? Because we don't have good cell phone coverage. Right? <laughs> Our camp, the tea house, which is a respite and rest camp, has really good bandwidth. It's an open Wi-Fi. So there's this clump of people on the outside of our camp is on their phones all the time. And then there's people relaxing. It's the two worlds. So the serpent has come in to Burning Man and these little points and it's grab monkeys, right? And they're like <laughs> hours and hours they're standing there overheating and you know, doing their thing and not making any eye contact. And when they go back out of the playa, they're not making any eye contact either, right? They're, they don't know where they are, they have to land again. So the default world that you call it has come in and plucked and consumed those monkeys temporarily. And it's like ravenous. Is why can't I get these monkeys? These, this ball of colorful monkeys that's on the pile. I want to eat them all. Or why can't I eat them? The serpent of tech is very, very frustrated. So you know you're angering the serpent of tech. So what I'm going to say to the madre, and I think you should say it too, is madre, your network is about to go offline. She was counting on our eye contact, the eye contact we're making right now, super powerful, super powerful eye contact. It's the most powerful network that exists. It's a network where love flows, health, assurance, brilliance. It's the most powerful network. That network is getting abrogated by this, or by glass or whatever, or sitting in front of a big plasma TV. Why? Because the pattern of the snake is being presented to us ever faster, in ever in more detail, better gauge, better everything. The snake is going to get it all, and then I'm going to get them all. So the eye contact you're making is what the Madre was counting on to make us whole, to make us a species that is up to her standards of the brilliance of her creation that will then pass the love that comes from the birth and the end of the universe, both, into the monkeys through this wonderful IP address network called Eye Contact and individual persons and raise us, elevate us, levitate us into ascension. 
And when we reach ascension and pure love and pure trust, that's how she gets off the planet. That's how she finds her new home. Only through that. It's not going to be Neil Armstrong-like characters, you know, in, in a test pilot mode, you know, going down their checklist. It has to be a planet-wide gifting of the new home for her and for us. It can only be done through the love ball. So we tell the Madre, excuse me, there is a problem in the plan. We were getting there. We stopped chopping each other's heads off. We invented phones and, and we invented health care and we got our food supplies down and we, we tore you apart. But now this thing has come in, which is partly your invention because it came from the creativity of evolution. We partly became crazy because you needed us a bit manic so that we'd actually get down and do things. This is why she didn't choose bonobos. Bonobos are this proto-primate family that they're hippies. They're more pure hippies than all the hippies that came out of the Haight-Ashbury. You watch bonobos at work in Guinea? They're like, you know, oh, I don't like you. You know, you gave me this bad look. Let's have sex now to work it out. Can you imagine that? Or, you're cute, and you've got a lot of lice and insects off you. Can I, like, clean you and have dinner? That's what bonobos do. Or, we found these bananas. Let's eat. And let's sleep for two days. That's what bonobo communities are. So she said, I'm not going to go anywhere near them. Because they're going to be the same two million years later as they are now. They'll be chill. They may invent jazz, but they'll never invent public transportation and crazy stock markets and all. They'll invent good music and they'll really go. Then they'll we'll rock the planet till the sun goes nova. But I need crazy monkeys, so she chose the chimp branch. She needed the manic ones. So we say to her, you made us manic. You gave us the snake. The mania with the snake, which is media and tech and money and dollar bills and, and craziness. You wanted that as part of the bargain because we can build ladders with that. We can build ladders to the stars. We can transport you off. But we're broken and the network's going dark. The love network, the, the eye contact network is about to go offline. So if we tell her all this, don't just do it in any way you can, it's basically Manic Monkey 101, or maybe we're in graduate school now. We need help to turn the network back on on an individual basis. And it's all about eye contact with your fellows, cuddle puddles like the original balls on the limbs of the trees. That is where your power is. That is where your power is. And it's the only defense against the onslaught of the snake. The snake is, is very wily. The snake is, is the most powerful thing that we've ever come up with, that evolution has ever come up with. So you've got to be really strong. It's a strong force. So when you leave the pie and you go to the so-called default world, and your phone starts texting, and you know it's coming back. But you can decide, I can do the dance with the snake. I'm still going to get my tree sand and I'm going to get my needs, but I'm going to go back to my ball, my community, which I make eye contact with. I'm going to do that because you now have to start to form a bubble of protection around yourself and your communities. Don't underestimate the power of this thing. It's only starting. You know, Google Glass and all that. And we're training our offspring. So your kids are grabbing that iPhone when they're two and a half, three years old, and they're going for that pixelated screen, and they can use it because it's a multi-touch device. The snake is getting to their minds really early. The snake is wily. If it grabs the offspring, the work to be done to bring them back to eye contact and love and the ball, they're now full ADHD. They're on the Asperger's autism continuum that I was on. I was on that continuum when I was born. They didn't have a name for it. I had to fight my way back out so I could make eye contact. It took 25 or 30 years to figure out, to overcome the resistance to eye contact. You know, if I was 21 years old and trying to do this in front of you now, I would be in a 
complete state of horror. But I managed to push the bubble out and realize, no, it's not a threat. They're not, they're not carnivores about to eat me, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's a huge job. But what I'm doing, telling you this story, is it gives you that context. It's a long journey, and we have come a long way fast. The stakes are incredibly high. This is why it's like a Hollywood thriller. What an incredible Hollywood thriller. You know, we're, we're going to run out of fossil fuels. At the same time as there's universal screens everywhere, universal penetration of media, 98% of the monkeys are going crazy. You know, not just Fox News, but the people on the left are going crazy. You know, in this country, it's the craziness is rising and rising and rising. It's not just 9-11, it's just the craziness is the, the ball is getting huge and huge. Think of, don't think of it in dire terms. Don't believe in conspiracy theories. I mean, think of it as magnificence. It is the creation of the biosphere. It's astoundingly magnificent. All the insanity, all the network of freeways, all the financial crashes, all the crazy people, the, the true men and monkeys, the psychopaths and sociopaths that we allow to lead us and to run our corporations, they're magnificent too because they're so bad, right? But they're just part of the monkey ball. And they're, they're tweaking the system. No one's running the show. Terrence McKenna was right. There is no one in charge. So because there is no one in charge, it's an emergent phenomenon. It's a magnificent rolling potential disaster triumph all in one. I call it the great crescendo. Everything's happening at once. All the instruments in the symphony are playing at once. It's this unbelievable thing. Here you, you've got sheriffs surrounding that pyramid last night, the dark forces. It says sheriff in the back. They've got their backpacks. They're full on belts. Right, and they're just moving in on those dancers. You saw them? Did you see, I see there were 12 deputies surrounding that pyramid over there. And they were just going into the backpacks and shining their lights. And, and yet we have built a ball. You know, this is so big. So it's here. This very thing is here. But don't think of those deputies as the enemy. Don't demonize individuals. Don't even identify individuals. It's a system. If you identify individuals or religious groups or whatnot, you're falling victim to something that will never give you truth, that will never give you your own personal love. It's, it's anti-love. The ecological niches that creates that sheriff's department, that creates those deputies who need to put their kids through college, and that sheriff who's up for election, those are niches, those are systems. And we can take those systems apart. Countries like Denmark have taken apart dysfunctional systems. Europe is way ahead of the rest of the world, creating humane systems. And the female, the power of the female is returning. And the females are now turning and coming back. Your power isn't going to come through all your Facebook posting. It's not going to come from doing the biggest commercial enterprise. You can create a product and make money and then somehow go out and do some social good. Because that's that's in the machine itself, right? And that takes you into the business world, which makes you crazy. But the true power only comes from the eye contact and the close-in physical balls of support to create safety and warmth and love in the human community. If you have that in your life, whether it's your spouse, your family, your ball, your, your collective, whatever, you can move out from there. If you've lost that, we know from our 90 million year old ancestry, the snake has got you. So with that, I think I'll, I'll close the, uh, this section and uh, we can throw it open to questions. Thank you very much. I think what we should do is, I can run around with this mic and okay. we can even take some questions. Raise your hand if you would like to ask a question. I'm a moving mic stand. Okay. Why do you use the snake metaphor? The uh, question was, why do I use the snake metaphor? Because it's actually through science and through our understanding of, of our evolutionary history the most likely mechanism. The snake was in the tree canopy and was our number one predator. And we were watching its scale patterns. And if, the way snakes hunt, they get close to the prey, try to mesmerize them, 
by stillness, but by these color patterns, and then they take them. So for 20 million years, this is what we were on the lookout for. So that's why I use the metaphor of the snake, because we're still mesmerized by pixels on screens, by clothing, by, you know, all the stuff here. Uh, you suggested that um, the snake was already made for our friend. How, how can how can society um, benefit from the snake uh, without being swallowed up by it? I think uh, this is a very good question. How can we benefit from the snake without being swallowed? Yeah, it's going to come down to a community of practice. It's all happened to us when you're on your phone and you've been texting all day and everything, and you're kind of fried. You're really fried. You know you've gone across the boundary. You've used up your cortisol. You've used up all your adrenaline, and you're, you need your coffee. And you're going to eventually go into adrenal shock syndrome by your 40s or 50s, which I did. Um, you have to gauge your own self. And it's really tough to do. But if we form communities of practice where like, we're going to come to a festival, we're going to take our kids out of home, and we're going into nature, it's going to take incredible discipline to do this, to push back against this snake. And we need the support of our friends to do that, be healthy. And then we use technology you know, to make good livings so that we can maybe live outside of you know, ugly living environments and commercial environments so we get ourselves enough cash to go live in a healthier place and telecommute. And the snake is allowing us to do that. And I live in the Redwood Forest and Santa Cruz Mountains because of the snake because of the snake. And it was dial-up initially, and now it's DSL. Wow. Right in front of you. Right in front of you. Put your hand up. I'm I'm the walking mic stand. It's sort of a follow-up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for the talk, guys. It's incredible. Um, but neuroplasticity, how does that fit in with the 20 million years, or I forgot how many million years of being exposed to the snake as the predator. Can, can we not change the way that we think through the way that our, our, our mind is made up through a neuroplasticity? The um, question is the neuroplasticity, which is this wonderful property that our minds actually don't, they're not all fixed and set in stone by a certain age. They continue to grow and new neurons continue to grow. I think that's a great hope. I think that's why she gave up on dinosaurs and arthropods and she picked us because we can do that trick. Even into our 80s, 90s, we can learn new tricks. You know, your great-grandfather using AOL when they're 95, for example. We're incredibly good. So that we can actually shape our minds away from the kind of trauma that too much cortisol squirting, snake-inducing, we can do it through, through eye contact and through, I think, you know, if you're raised in a stimulus response Pavlovian world, like your kids might be, you have to give them really high end, like a Burning Man experience, really high end stimulus. They go, this is cool, this is better than World of Warcraft. It's better and it's cooler. And now they get into extreme sports and outside and everything, and their neuroplasticity takes them beyond the World of Warcraft. So they can do World of Warcraft or Angry Birds or whatever, but now they're into a whole new thing, which is physical. And that's music, play. That's music, play, you know, uh, all these new sports, fantastic stuff, composing their own, you know, their own media. It's all good. I think the only way to know if you're getting eaten by the snake is if you feel like shit. If you feel in your head, you feel worn out and tired out, you're not getting eaten if you just feel good. You know, yoga matters, daily practices, breath works, you, people stop breathing in front of computers. So the whole of the collective of humanity is undergoing a strangle response. Think about that. If you stop breathing, you start feeling a sense of panic and dread. When you're at your computer, they've done studies, it's like 60% of people, their breath goes way down to shallow, or they hold their breath. So that's a biggie. And, and in the morning, say if you've done too much email till 2 a.m., that prevents your body from making the right chemicals to sleep properly. So, and then you wake up unrested, and then you, you feel dread also. 
It's a cycle that goes. And you know when you're in that cycle. Why? Because you're going to come back from the playa, and that cycle's going to re reassert itself. Make this the uh, last question, and we'll wrap up a little bit. Thank you. Uh, you talked about the uh, failure. How did you I went through, uh, I had the death of my mother, the death of many people around me in the last 12 months, and I done like 30 international trips in four years, finished a PhD, and by March I went into total failure. Adrenal failure, no energy, core energy gone. And I had to work my way out of it. I joined a men's encounter group. I did some journeying. I did incredible physical exercise. And only about three weeks ago, my internal positive energy mill you know, Dynamo just started to turn again. But it was it was down and offline and crashed for about 10 months. And some of my friends have said, you're lucky that it didn't take years or that it never started again. So that's being eaten by the snake, I think. So, so we got to wrap up here. And he has a, a podcast called Dr. Dr. Bruce's Dr. Levity Zone. Look for Levity Zone. And uh, you'll find it in iTunes and on the web and stuff like that. We've had 16 shows. Hope you like it. And I've just launched a new curated visual website about the future. It's easy to remember. Futurewow.com. Thank you. Yes, Futurewow. That's really what that is. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Beautiful people. In the next couple of podcasts, we will have two or possibly three more Burning Man raps, which should continue to weave the larger story together. My urge, my dream, and my goal is to somehow figure it all out, or at least one angle of it, and put together a vision for you that will be uplifting and show a way forward out of the darkness of our own making through the bright crack into a future we all know is possible. Thanks to Jake McDonald for his uplifting track, Lost in the Woods, from his Sacred Vine label, which we used in the intro and you'll hear in the outro.